Amen. Okay, excellent. Let's, um, we're going to just dive right in, and uh, we're in Daniel, as has been said, and as obviously we've read that text. And so last week, we read the whole chapter, and then what we're going to do over the next couple sermons is really just take a couple chunks and really narrow in on some things. And I will say it was just a great joy to get together with a couple of the other elders this week and really pray through uh, the preaching calendar for this uh, series. And there's some incredible things coming, you guys. Just I believe that God is going to use this series to strengthen this church and to strengthen you individually. So last week, just to dive right in, we were introduced to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Az- Azariah. Uh, those were their given names, and later in the, in the sermon you'll see that we'll, and we'll cover what their, their new names meant. But they are exiles now in Babylon, and they're part of an inner circle of elite and skilled young men that the king took from their homes, from Jerusalem, for himself, and now he's wanting to groom them for his purposes. Just to sort of bring us up to speed, they're captured, they're now, the city has been besieged, the evil king, wicked Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar takes them, has them now in Babylon, and now Daniel and his three friends are part of this inner circle that he's going to now groom for the purposes of that kingdom. What he wants to do, according to verse four and five, if you sort of glance your eyes down there, verse four four and five, he wants to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. He wants to give them a daily portion of the king's food and wine and to educate them for three years under this new regiment. So three years of different food, three years of whole new language and a way of seeing life from the, through the eyes of a Babylonian kingdom as opposed to a drastically different Hebrew culture. The hope is at the end of verse five, what it says is that after three years, they would stand before the king and be worthy of a position in the king's palace. That's the goal. That's the hope of Nebuchadnezzar and that system is that through indoctrinating them through these three years of training and strict regimented food and diet and education, that after those three years, they'll be ready to stand before the king in the palace. So a position, a place, but for the king's purposes. So there's two things that I want to highlight in our time together this morning, and you probably already caught it as we read through I want to look at their identity, the identity of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and then their resolve, their identity and their resolve. So just those two things, and that's the, what we're going to focus on, and in turn, we're going to see application for, for the Christian life, for our identity and our resolve. So those two things, identity and resolve. And the very first point, we'll start with the point, and then we'll go into the text. When your identity is based on what God has done Nobody can take that away from you. When your identity is based on what God has done, nobody can take that away from you. Your identity is who you are. That's who you are. Who you are is the foundation. If, if you know who you are, that's the foundation. If you get that wrong, if you're confused on who you are and who God intends for you to be, if you get that wrong, then everything else around that just sort of falls apart and crumbles. In this context that we're in, Israel had an identity shaped by what God had done for them. And we talked about that history last week. And there's a lot of history prior to where we are here in Daniel chapter 1, this 6th century BC, 600 years before Christ. But previous to Daniel's life, we know that there's an identity that was given to God's people, the Hebrew people. God had called them. God had set them apart for himself. God had done things for them that he didn't do for any other nation. They were a special people. He set them apart for himself to be the people through whom he would send the Messiah. That was their identity. We are God's chosen people. Through us, the nations of the earth will be blessed. And while they waited for the Messiah, they were called to be a light to the nations. That's an interesting thing about being a chosen people by God is that You are called then at that point to be a light to all those around you, all the other nations. So Israel had a unique and different calling, perspective. Everything about them was to be different than all of the other nations. And in that difference, they were to be a light, to show the nations the glory of God. 
and the plan of God and the kingdom of God. They were to be a witness to the glory and the holiness of God. And that holiness is something we're gonna sort of narrow in on as well because in them being different from everyone else, we start to then begin to see sort of a definition of what holiness is. Holiness means to be set apart. God is holy. God is different. God is not like us. He is a light to every one of us. He shows us what the truth is. God is truth. Ultimately, we know Jesus God in flesh is the epitome, the manifestation of truth. How we see visually what God wants to say to us is Jesus Christ and everything that he is and everything that he did. It's God's message of truth to us. The other nations, like this Babylonian kingdom and Nebuchadnezzar, they worshiped false deities. They actively, at this moment where Daniel is here in this kingdom, you have to know that they actively worship false deities that are opposed to the God of Daniel and his friends. They worship false deities. They were worthless, weak, not worthy to be called God, yet they were worshiped. We saw at the beginning of the chapter, it says that he took the temple artifacts and brought them into the treasury of his God. They were Worshippers. They were worshipers, but they worshiped false deities. And over all of this is God, who is perfect light and holiness. Now, God cannot be swayed from sin. So, the great thing about God, and there's many, it's an understatement of the century, the great thing about God, God is great. One of the many millions of great things about God is that he cannot be swayed by darkness. He's unchangeable. God cannot be tempted by evil. He cannot sin. He will not sin. He is perfect. He is set apart. He's not like us. He's not like you and me. So over all of this system that Daniel is in, God is light, God is holiness, and he cannot be swayed or influenced. But the humans, on the other hand, that he calls to be witnesses to the darkness, they can be swayed. You and I, we can be influenced by evil, by sin, by darkness. We can have really good intentions and then see something attractive or shiny or, and then be swayed. And each of us have temptations. Each of us have different things that would seek to steer us away from what is good and right and what is holy. So he calls Daniel to be witnesses to that light. Daniel and his friends to be in this place. God put them there to be a witness, to be a light to those people. But they can be swayed, can be tempted to conform to the darkness around them. Daniel and his friends were faithful Israelites up to this point. Faithful, and this, the text tells us that they were of the royal tribe. Those that he called, he wanted, and Nebuchadnezzar wanted those from royalty and nobility. Get the best of the best of Israel. Get the cream of the crop. Take them from this royal tribe, the tribe of Judah, which, by the way, is that tribe through which Jesus would come, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Just an interesting parallel Daniel's from that tribe as well. Daniel and his friends were faithful Israelites of that tribe, raised on the stories of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, faithful to those texts and to that calling. And who told them these things? This is some underlying, not on the surface of the text, but where did Daniel and his friends receive this sure, strong foundation? Had to be their parents had to be their parents that taught them, as God said, teach your children these things. In your households, at the table, as you gather, put them on the mantles of your doorposts, teach them the scriptures, teach them the way of God. And so these young men, they don't go into Babylon without discipleship and not already being told what it is to be followers of God. Up to the point of this invasion, I would say that Daniel and his friends, they knew their identity as God's chosen people. They knew who they were. From the very beginning of this, they knew who they were. Hebrews, God's chosen people, special, called to be lights. It wasn't gonna be easy for Nebuchadnezzar 
to sway them. John Calvin says in his commentary that he wrote, Nebuchadnezzar knew that the Jews were a stiff-necked and obstinate people and that they would require some softening. Nebuchadnezzar knew something about the Hebrew people that by capturing them, it wasn't gonna just be an overnight change, that it was gonna take three years maybe. The attempt was gonna be not overnight, but to soften them, give them food, give them a good place to stay, attract them to their way of thinking and their way of doing life, their worldview. So make no mistake about this, what the king is doing is using the art of indoctrination to attack and change their identity. Let's read it again so we're getting it from the text. And with that in mind, think about this. The king commanded Ashpenaz in verse three, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal tribe and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. This is, without a doubt, a system of indoctrinating these godly people to think differently than how God wants them to think. And that same pressure, that very same opposition is existing today. And you've seen it, you have experienced it, you're living it, you will until the day Jesus takes you home. You will, there will be that opposition. There is another kingdom There are kingdoms around us. There is darkness. There is, and it's never, well, see, Satan is subtle. Spiritual warfare is often subtle. But this is, without a doubt, indoctrination. By getting them to question their identity in God, they might conform to this world. Sounds familiar. And then begin to see who they are in relation to the world rather than to God. So we have many texts in the New Testament that teach this very same principle to us, one of which is Romans 12, 2. Paul said to the Romans in chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, it is Satan who conforms while it is God who transforms. Satan seeks that slow conformity to the world. All Satan can do is take what God has made and try to steal it for himself and over time conform it and conform God's people. Isn't that interesting? All Nebuchadnezzar could do is take what God had already done and seek to over time morph it. It is only God who can take what is broken and weak and because of sin have that weakness weakness and brokenness and then God powerfully transforms it from death to life. God can do transformative work. Satan can't do that, but he can take those that have an identity in God and indoctrinate. There is a world system, people, and I know you see this. If you don't, open your eyes. There's a world system. Satan is behind it. His demons are behind it. There are many in this world who reject Christ and rally behind an insidious agenda to ensnare the minds of people into that system and that thinking. We have to be aware of that. Not fearful of it, but aware. And what we will find today is that the very same thing is happening today as is in this text. Three things. They attack who the person is, feed them what the world has to offer, educate people with an anti-God system and an anti-God curriculum. Isn't that going on today? It is happening today. It happens around us. It happens in our midst. It is all over the place, attacking who a person is. Even at this very moment today, there are preachers, I wasn't sure I was gonna mention this, but it does fit Just to our north in Canada, there is an agenda to make it illegal to speak the truth of God on biblical sexuality. And what is sexuality? It gets at the heart of how God created humanity, who the person is. You can't tell me that God isn't attacking identity, or excuse me, that Satan isn't attacking identity. 
this very moment, seeking to sway entire nations to abandon who God created people to be, their very identity. It is everywhere, this agenda. Attack who the person is, then feed them. Feed them the world's goods. Feed them what the world says is good. Nebuchadnezzar says, feed them my food for three years. That will change them. Educate people with an anti-God system and an anti-God curriculum, and that certainly is the case in much of our education system, and the purpose is to change and transform the hearts of young people to see that there is no creator. You are nothing but a clump of cells, randomly, haphazardly arranged, no purpose. And we've all seen this. And the, the, the thing is, is this, this appeals to many. It appeals to so many. It even appeals to some so-called Christians who are not rooting their identity in Christ. If the world system is still appealing to you today, it's because you're not rooted in Christ. Your identity is not rooted in Christ. You don't know who you are yet. You're still trying to figure out who you are, and so you have the world telling you this is who you are and who you should be, and guess what? That's attractive to the flesh, but you have God saying this is who you are, this is who I made you to be. It's gonna take some repentance and some serious commitment here, but here's where you get true peace and eternal life. Eternal life. The New Testament commands us, 1 John 2, 15 to 17, 1 John chapter 2. The apostle brings up this idea of the world system. And this is what we're commanded to do. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So the difficulty with this is that if you don't believe that this world is passing away, see, that's the, that's the, the pivot point of that text. Do you believe the world is passing away or is it the world that's forever and God is passing away? What is it that's actually fleeting and insignificant and passing away? The world tells you, no, it's God. God is the one that's passing away. Religion passes away. Spiritual truth is up for debate. It's a whatever you want it to be. You can make, it's passing away, it's fleeting. But the truth of the scripture tells us, no, it is the desires of the flesh and the world and the pride of life. That is what's passing away. What remains is the will of God and those who abide in the will of God. That's what is forever. But if you don't believe the world is passing away, you will cling to the things of this world and you will believe the lie that the only way to be worth something is to do what you want and what you enjoy. And don't you see that around you? Maybe you see that even in your heart. You're pulled to find your identity in what feels good and what you say, I want, this is what, this is what I want to do, this is what I enjoy. Why do you continue to do these things? Because I like it, because I enjoy it. Well, does God approve of it? What does God think of it? That life of just doing what the flesh desires and enjoys is no surrender, no fight, no resolve to stand against the system and stand for holiness and righteousness, yet that's what Christians are called to do. Church, we are called to stand for holiness in our lives, to live holy as he is holy and to stand for righteousness, right living, right things, things that are right according to God's standard. And that is not legalism. So if, if you're hearing me say things about living right and doing the right things, that's not legalism. And if anybody ever told you that if, you ha if you're told to do the commands of God, that's legalism, somebody taught you a wonky, wonky system God is holy and his holiness commands and demands our holiness. We have Christ as our mediator and perfect sacrifice for when we fail, when we can't keep his commands. But the command is still there, be holy as I am holy. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, Jesus said. 
If you do take what the world has to offer, all those things that are pleasing to the eyes, and all this is a parallel. Daniel and his friends are in a system now where they're being faced with what that world at that time, that culture is saying, here, take this, and it would have been tempting. I guarantee, uh, in, a, in, a, in a place like Babylon, with riches and gold and pleasures abounding, and now they're in this place and being treated well. Yes, they were ripped from their homes, but now they're being pampered. And that Nebuchadnezzar wants to see them raised up, and it would have been tempting. And I guarantee many that we aren't told about did go that way. And they took of the king's delicacies and his food. But if you take what is pleasing to the eye and the flesh and to the ego, what you're doing is you're swallowing that hook hidden inside of that bait that Satan put there and you will never, ever, ever see or experience the ultimate joy of living for God if you continue to take only what the world says is pleasing. 1 John 2.17 Again, I repeat, the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Daniel wants to do the will of God. That's the point that I'm making here. Daniel wants the will of God. His identity is as a child of God, a Hebrew called by God, special, chosen, rescued. All the stories of being pulled out of Egypt, rescued from slavery, those are in Daniel's head. He knows who he is, and that's what came first. He knows who he is, and that's building in him a desire to do the will of God. These young men, they're not in an easy place, but what we can tell as the story unfolds is that they knew who they were and where they stood with God. Regardless of their circumstances, they knew their identities as children of God, and therefore, they could not be ultimately swayed. And I think that's a key word. They could not be ultimately swayed. I'm sure there were moments of doubt. I'm sure there were moments of saying, this is hard. Are you sure we can do this? Are you sure we can stand here and not go with this flow? This is going to be difficult. Doubts come up in our mind, but ultimately swayed? No. To give you an idea of how deeply they seek to change their identity, I want to just show you so that you can see, I want to show you the meaning of their names before and after, because here this came up in our text. It says, among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe, and the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. And it is crazy that the stories as they've been passed down through when we teach them to the kids and they show up in like Veggie Tales and kids' Bibles, you know, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know what's crazy though is they had better names than that. Those were their Babylonian names. They had God-given names. Look at the meaning of these. The name Daniel, meaning God is my judge, was changed to Belteshazzar, meaning Bel's prince. Bel, the god, a god of the Babylonians, Bel's prince. From God is my judge, Yahweh is my judge, to Bel's prince. The name Hananiah meant beloved by the Lord, Beloved by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was changed to Shadrach, meaning illumined by sun God. The name Mishael, meaning who is as God, was changed to Meshach, meaning who is like Venus. The name Azariah, meaning the Lord is my help, was changed to Abednego, meaning servant of Nego, another Babylonian god. Seeking to change the very core of who they were, change their names, give them Babylonian names, teach them the way of the Chaldeans, fill them with that doctrine so that they forget who they are in God. We have to watch out for this, church. The attempt to rename, redefine, Re-educate and reorient your lives around the world and its system are evident everywhere. You and I need to be aware of that. Don't be oblivious to it. Again, not fearful, but just aware. And then diligent and vigilant 
about keeping your eyes fixed on Christ, where your identity comes from. If you're in Christ, and he has rescued you from slavery of sin, then you are not who you used to be. Your identity is in him. You're in Christ. When, you put our, when we put our faith in Jesus and what he has done to save us, we become adopted heirs of God, loved, chosen, forgiven children of God. His. That's who we are in Christ. Now again, that is a unique thing for the one whose faith is in Christ. If you're in Christ and you've trusted him as your savior, the redeemer, your savior, who alone paid the price for your sin and resurrected to conquer and overcome your sin and give you life, then you now have an imputed righteousness and you are in him. We are his workmanship. Scripture says it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's an identity statement, church. The song that we sang, it is not I, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. That's my identity. That should be, I hope, I pray, the majority of your identities that you are in Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. That's an identity statement. I'm not condemned. I'm saved. I'm redeemed. I'm forgiven. This is who I am in Christ. This is who we are because of what God has done in sending Jesus into our captivity to set us free. Which brings us to just the second point, and there's only two for this sermon. The second point, Christ-centered identity leads to Christ-centered purpose in life. You have to have the first one. You have to know who you are. Had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, or Belteshazzar. See, I always give Daniel his good name, and the other get the bad name. I don't know what's up with that. Daniel, Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah, they all had their identity in God before this trial. Before this came, so they knew who they were, which brings us to how Daniel could say what he's about to say. So after facing the reality of what life in Babylon was going to be like, Daniel had to make a choice. I'm sure very quickly after being there and seeing the surroundings, he's beginning to think, what are the next three years going to be like? What is my life going to be like here from here on out? I know God's gonna use me here, but he had to make a choice, much like the choices that you and I have to make today and tomorrow and every day. The choice he made was birthed from his identity in God. Because he belonged to God, his heart was God's as well. Because he belonged to God, what was in his heart, his desires, what he wanted was God's as well, and that's an issue of holiness. Your heart conforming, transforming into the likeness of Christ and the desires of Christ, longing in your heart for those things that God loves and having an intentional eye for that is caring about holiness, caring about being set apart for him. So interestingly enough, they did not rebel against the name change. These are some interesting details. They didn't say, no, don't change my name. They didn't rebel against the education. We don't see that in the the text. The line was drawn with what? The food, the meat and the wine. The key, let's let's read the text, verse eight, beginning in verse eight. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, He asked the the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to be, or excuse me, not to defile himself. So they were going to be fed a daily portion of wine and meat. They drew the line there. Daniel at least stands up as one who cares about holiness and clearly from the text, the defilement of his soul. And I think that the the key to understanding why is the phrase, the king's food. It wasn't just any normal food. 
it was food from the king's table. It wasn't about taste. He wasn't like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to like the taste of that. I'm sure it was going to be the best food they had ever tasted. It wasn't about health or preference primarily. Though he knew that God would bless them and make them healthier, he didn't say, I don't want this because it's not healthy enough. I don't want this because it's not my preference. I don't want this because I don't like the taste. He said, I don't want this food from the king. It was connected directly to the king. It was about defilement. Verse 8 tells us that Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. He used a strong word. He believed that it would ultimately pollute or stain his life in God. That by allowing himself to go that far to take of that food was going to be something extremely tragic. Daniel believed that by eating the king's food and drinking his wine, he would compromise obedience to God and therefore compromise holiness. So I just want to ask you, does that sort of thing matter to you? Not compromising your holiness. Holiness that God gives you, but then that you have the opportunity and the responsibility to then steward. Does that matter to you that you don't compromise your faith, that you don't compromise the things that God has made sure to you and that you know are right. And you know the things that are too far, too much, too gross to you. Those things that are too connected, too worldly, too evil, connected to evil and sin because you know who you are in Christ and who he made you to be, you will purpose in your heart not to defile yourself with those things. And you have to know those things. You have to know what those things are. And I will say the only way to know what those things are, one, is to know who, you're, who you are in Christ, to have your identity in him, and to know what he thinks, to know his word. The food was likely offered to idols, and there is definitely much around that and speculation that the reason he didn't want to take this food is because it was food offered to idols. The only problem was that with that is that this was all Babylonian food, and the vegetables were also probably somehow linked to idolatry somewhere in the kingdom. So there was something unique about this food. Again, it was that it was from the king's table. It was from the king's food. The wine also probably dedicated to idols, but I believe that the real reason for resolving to not eat or drink was because it came from the king. Daniel, later, he will work for the king. He will serve in the king's presence. He will interpret his dreams In the next several chapters, we'll see that. He will be near the king. He will be in his presence, one day raised up to power and influence, even in that kingdom. Daniel doesn't have an uh, an issue being near the king or even being in that kingdom. But he will not fellowship with darkness in such an intimate way as sharing the very things that the king indulged himself on daily. He drew the line there. I just think that's an interesting thing to know that that intimate of a sharing, the king eats this food, this is his food, this is what he indulges himself on daily. I will not eat and defile myself of the king's food. I'm not gonna go there. He would not compromise. He would not compromise. So think about that for a moment. Think about that word compromise. I'm sure you've heard teachings and sermons on compromise. Please listen. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. This is a problem for many Christians today. Compromise is a serious problem. And we do not resolve in our hearts to not compromise. And so what happens? The moment comes. The temptation comes. And what do we do? We make a deal. We make a deal. We're like, well, I don't agree with the world, but I'll make a deal with you. And we compromise. A compromised Christian is one who will not take risks for the sake of their holiness, but will look for loopholes in order to keep one foot in the church and one foot in the world. A compromising Christian is one who will not take risks for the sake of their holiness, but will look for loopholes in order to keep one foot in the church and one foot in the world. Does that make sense? You're looking for loopholes 
If you want to know whether you're a compromising Christian, then you're one who's looking for ways around the things that are sure and true that God has said, this is not for you. This is not for my people. This is not holy. This is not pure. This is not right. Well, can I, well, what if I just did this? Well, what if I did this? And you're looking for ways around it rather than the resolve to stand on the holiness of God and the righteousness of his word. And the interesting thing about this is that most of the time, this is something that you as an individual Christian has to know yourself as you seek God. There are areas that you will compromise in if you do a certain thing that may not be the same for the person next to you. You need to be someone who seeks the Lord, seeks after his word to know what he requires of you and asks of you. And then you will know, God will teach you, he will speak to you, what are those areas of compromise. The one who compromises is not the way of a Christian, but a person who has yet to surrender to the lordship of Christ. One thing I love about Daniel is you get the the sense that he was under the lordship of God there face to face with another king and another ruler of great, great influence and he did not surrender and he did not compromise. Isn't that inspiring, church? Isn't that inspiring? We should be inspired by Daniel. We, we, we say often the ultimate inspiration is Jesus Christ, right? And we will get to that at the end of this sermon. We'll see how does this wrap into the gospel and into our relationship with Christ, But this is inspiring. Daniel stood his ground. He resolved, I will not eat of the king's food. I will not compromise. Charles Spurgeon said this, Daniel and his friends knew this would cost them something, yet they were willing. Be ready for a bad name. Be willing to be called a bigot. Be prepared for the loss of friendships. Be prepared for anything so long as you can stand fast by him who bought you with his precious blood. Be willing, church. We have these opportunities everywhere, do we not? To stand, to stand for Christ, to stand upon our convictions, even if it costs us something. This was going to cost them potentially a lot. This was a massive risk. To say here, we're not gonna eat that food. Are you willing? Are you willing to do this? I think that's a fair question. Are we willing in this world that we live in to be people without compromise and to make resolves in our heart? It says, but Daniel resolved. The King James Version or New King James says, he purposed in his heart. I like that too. Resolve, purpose, but they knew who they were. They knew their identity in God and therefore, They knew the purpose that they had to live for and it was for God and their heart was there too. He did it at the beginning of his time in Babylon. He did it before the major temptations would come. He resolved early on. Each of us need to make this purpose in our hearts today, I believe. Every one of us. In some way, some fashion, purpose in your heart, I'm not going to be with the king's delicacies. I'm not going to take of that thing that is tempting me. I'm not going to look for loopholes. I'm going to stand upon the word of God on everything that is biblical. I'm going to stand on sola scriptura. I'm going to stand on the authority of scripture. I'm going to stand on biblical sexuality. I'm going to stand on workplace ethics that are biblical and Christian. I'm not going to compromise so that I can keep friends. I'm not going to compromise so I can get a raise. I'm not going to look for loopholes. I'm going to just say, God, I'm willing to do what you say, whatever it is. So we each need to make this purpose, I believe, today. Maybe before leaving here today, you need to get prayer for that purpose that you're seeking to solidify in your heart. Maybe that's the one thing that when we say, guys, hey, before you leave here, get prayer. We're up at the front. Elders will pray for you. Your friends, that's, maybe that's the thing. That there is a thing that God is telling you. You need to purpose in your heart to not go this way. You're gonna resolve To live for God, you're gonna plant your feet in holiness, the holiness of Christ, and then be prayed for. Ask brothers and sisters to come around you and help you in that. But it begins with identity, right? 
If you know who you are and what good God designed you and your life for, you can purpose to live for him no matter the cost. If your identity is still in the world and you're a product still, you believe, of your past sins and the sins of others, then you have no foundation to cling to even if you had the desire to do better in the places that you are, in your workplaces, in your schools, in the, where you have socialization. If you, even if you wanted to do better, if you don't have a foundation in who you are in Christ and you're not sure and rooted and grounded in him, that will be absolutely impossible. It'll be impossible to stand your ground, and that's why we need the gospel. That's why it's important to say that the greater Daniel is Jesus Christ. That's why it's important now to say we are failures. We will try this. We will fall. We will stumble. We will try to not compromise, but then we'll compromise. How do we do that without ruining ourselves with anxiety, thinking I can't stop failing? Because it's not in our own strength. Because it's as we look to Jesus Christ together. The purpose of Daniel, along with every other book, is to point us to Jesus. Jesus also purposed in his heart. He had a purpose in his heart to live a life undefiled and unstained by the world. Isn't that cool? He set out with a purpose from heaven to be undefiled unstained, and he did this with a sure identity. Now, yes, he was God, and he is God. There was no way he would fail, but he came and lived our very temptations that we live. He felt the temptation that humanity feels, the pull towards the world. He felt it. He didn't ever give in. Scripture says he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. Where's that line? I don't know, but I feel like he probably went as far as it would be for us to relate to him and him to relate to us without sinning. He knows what it's like to overcome and give in, no, not give in to temptation. So he can relate to you. You have a perfect high priest, a perfect one who stands in the gap. So when you go to him, you don't say, you don't understand Jesus. No, he does understand which is why he came to this world the way he did. He had a sure identity. He knew who he was in relation to the Father. Here's a quick text to show that. Matthew 3, 16, uh, Jesus' baptism. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well Pleased. That was within the hearing of Jesus. Jesus heard his father say, you are my son and I'm pleased with you. I'm pleased with your work. I'm pleased with what you're going to do. You are my son. Don't forget that. You're gonna be persecuted. There's gonna be pressure, but you're my son. I've sent you here for a purpose. Where did he go after this? Into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Isn't that interesting? After hearing his identity from the Father, as a human being come to feel this in our place, to feel humanity in our place, he was sent into the wilderness to be tempted and tested by Satan, the Father telling the Son that he was his beloved and that he was pleased with him. That was his identity. Eternal Son, eternally loved by the Father, and Jesus knew this and he trusted this. Jesus took upon ultimate banishment, didn't he? Daniel and his friends were banished, exiled. Jesus took on ultimate banishment when he went to the cross and took our sins upon himself. Banished. Even the father forsaking him for that moment, for Jesus cried out, Father, why have you forsaken me? No worse banishment than that ever in the universe, in the history of any time, ever, than that moment where the perfect, holy Son of God, taking upon your sin and my sin, was necessarily turned away from by the Father to show us the seriousness of sin and the grossness of sin, but the willingness of Jesus to bear it for us. His exile and his entering into our captivity made the way for our reconciliation. He purposed in his heart to do the will of the Father so that we can lean on him in our weakness and inability. When we are weak, he is strong. 
So if this just, what, if what this does is brings about in you a, a feeling of weakness, well, I'll never be like Daniel. I can't do that. I mean, if I was faced with Nebuchadnezzar, I would eat all the meat. I would just be there eating. It'd be so good. <laughs> well, you need Jesus. <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, Jesus did not give way. He did not succumb to the pressure. He did faithfully and successfully do the will of God perfectly on our behalf. So what's it, what is it for us to do? It's our job to believe this. It's our job to believe what Christ has done. Not to try to be like Daniel per se, but to trust that Jesus did enough. That Jesus did enough and that he is our strength to live in this world. Christ is the strength that we need to live in this world with all of the opposing pressure that we'll face. His life was enough. His death was in our place. His sacrificial offering was accepted by the Father. His resurrection beat sin and death completely and finally. His ascension to heaven is our peace knowing that the work is finished, death is overcome, and peace was made by our justification. All of that is final and sure. So what do we do? We believe him. We believe Christ, the greater Daniel. And he's worthy every day of our resolve. That in us should build in us a desire even more so than when we walked into this room. Oh yeah, I'm reminded, God is so good. Jesus is so faithful. He's done everything for me. I want to stand for him without compromise. I want to. His grace does not lead us to further sin. His grace calls us to holiness. It should lead us to stand every day against the rip current of sin and evil, to spread his kingdom far and wide, to preach the gospel and even take risks to spread that kingdom. Take risks to preach the gospel and spread it as far as we can and live holy lives and do it without compromising our faith. Faith in what we know to be true. So we have some time left on this world, right? None of us know how long that is. We have time left and there are many, many more tests to come. We will be tested. I wish that, I, how cool would it be to preach a sermon where you could say, guys, it's all over, tests are done. You're gonna have a great day tomorrow. It won't be hard. I, we just can't do that. It's actually not even God's purpose. God's purpose in our hearts is that we would long for that day when we're in his presence and then all of that will be done. But here, here, he gives us the resolve to be his people, to stand for his kingdom, to stand for righteousness, and he gives us his Holy Spirit to be our strength that we need for that. And tests and trying days, they are purifying. So know who you are in Christ, know your identity, and from that place resolve in your heart to live confidently, fearlessly, and wholly before him in this crooked world. Amen, church? Let's go before the Lord. Let's pray. Let's ask him to give us that resolve. Please don't hesitate to pray specific prayers with, between you and the Lord. If you need things to, that God is telling you to purpose this in your heart, then let's, let's go before the Lord and ask him to do that. Father, we are, we are certainly a people that need your grace today in this very moment. This very moment, we are weak I pray that our identities would be founded in you, that we would not be just shaping our lives by our history and the things that have happened or the things that have happened to others that have influenced us. I pray that our identities would be firmly rooted in Christ and what he has done and who he is. Because in Christ, our sins are forgiven. And in Christ, we don't have to walk through this world alone anymore. We're not alone. That's not who we are. We have a faithful high priest. We have a father because of Jesus. A perfect father, a heavenly father. One who does not leave us as orphans, one who rescues and redeems and gives and provides. And you provided the most 
ultimate thing that we could ever need, and that is our redemption, our cleansing. To go from death to life. So God, we pray for that identity to be sure and strengthened and strong in each of us, God. If we've doubted who we are, then of course we're gonna doubt what our purpose is. So God, give us that identity in Jesus. If today there are people in this room that have not bowed and surrendered to Christ as Lord, may they do that and find that their identity does not have to be in this lost and broken world and in the sin they inherited through their parents but we can be made clean and made new. And having discovered that identity, God, give us a purpose that is sure, purpose in our hearts, God, to do what is right, to do what is good, to do what is holy, to stand for you, to not compromise. I pray for all those areas maybe where we struggle, where we are tempted daily to compromise, to make concessions, to agree with the world, to make deals with Satan. God, that we would not do that. That we would purpose in our hearts to live for you. Father, give us this strength. Give us, please, the ability to stand in this world. I pray that we would be a light to all the other nations, so to speak, Lord, that we would be a light to those who have yet to come to Jesus. Fill us with your spirit, God. Fill us with your strength. Thank you that when you are, that when we are weak, you are strong. Thank you that you are the perfect Daniel, the greater Daniel, that you, you were faithful to the end, Lord. We give you this time, Lord. We give you our lives. We surrender to you. We thank you for your word. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.